All right. Public comment. Do we have uh, people available and eligible for public comment? I see Joshua Smith here. Um, he may be here for the cable access discussion, though. Probably. It's, Josh, if you have a question now, raise your hand. We can address it. Otherwise, we'll move on. Um, I keep an eye on it. I forgot my computer to That's hook it up. Right. You're still looking up and seeing it. <laughs> all right. So, well, then we move right into the um, <clears throat> cable access discussion, which is our first bit of new business. Um, is it just Josh? Do we have the people in? Do we see? Um, um, well, Joshua did make a comment. He just said that he saw that cable access discussion was on the agenda, so he thought he'd pop in and, and listen in. Uh, the reason why we added this on the agenda is because there was a resident who had popped into the last meeting. Cricket Heart, yes. Yes, who thought that we were going to discuss cable access then, and she had some <clears throat> concerns that she wanted to bring up, so we decided to move it to this agenda. But I don't, I don't see her here to talk about it. Um, I don't have any updates. I know I reached out to National Grid with some questions that Greg and I had discussed. Um, and I've only got back from them. I'll look into this, so I don't have any concrete information to report back on that yet. Okay, that question specifically is to try to determine if the town has the right to use a portion of the national grid poles anyway, so we could consider running our own wires. Um, if that was the expense issue, we were also hoping to hear from uh, Cricket as to whether the expense, uh, the concern was, as I recall, um, she had lined up service through charter and they were all set to attach and then right before they did so they said there was going to be a three thousand dollar pole fee and i was not clear if that pole fee was to add a new pole because there wasn't one or it was just a fee to attach to an existing pole and i wanted to get more information about that to, to look into it because i'm um, obviously three thousand dollars to attach a, a pole sounds a bit exorbitant um, but i'm wondering if it was because they needed a new pole added that sounds about right for installing the pole. But Matt, I don't know if you had any more information than that. Um, I think uh, similarly what you're saying, I, I believe though that the pole may be a pole that would need to be on the personal property because they can't do an overhead wire all the way to the house from the house's distance from the street. So it may not be one of the poles that would ever show up on our request from National Grid to add a poll because it wouldn't be in our right of way. Um, I do know that I've had a couple other people mention that the distance of their house from the street generally results in the same thing, a $3,000 type connection cost. And so it just stops them dead in the street from connecting or dead in the water. How are these folks getting electricity? It's a good question. I don't know if these houses were built with some type of underground conduit to feed the power and then it never got a low voltage, but the same thing would apply to phone lines. So I don't understand that. You wouldn't run the phone any low voltage with the high voltage. So even if the house was constructed um, and, and you ran a phone and a power, you'd have a separate phone and power conduit. And therefore you could run the cable through the phone conduit. There's nothing Exactly. Wrong. So it does make me... I have the same question you do. I don't understand why this happens. It should be something there already, but they can certainly always put their own conduit back on the ground and, and, and run a little voltage wire for that as well. That's pretty easy to do. Um, I don't know the regulations. I know for high voltage, you gotta be, I think 12 inches down if it's a metal conduit and two feet down if it's plastic, something like that. But, I don't know if for low voltage, if you need that same depth to run a, a, something by themselves, that'd be a question for the electrical inspector. But um, I would think it'd be rather easy to trench it down and put a, a low voltage wire underground. Um, you know, it's a little bit of work in the, in the springtime with a shovel or, or a, um, a hoe, but I, you know, I would guess so if they have phone service, there's going to be a phone wire there and there must be a an area that that cable goes to, I don't see why they couldn't run a, a cable through as well. Yeah, and I think each each property is going to have varying.
details like that. So one house, it might be because they need an additional underground conduit because maybe the phone line was installed in some type of odd sealed, or maybe they ran a direct berry line so it doesn't even have conduit. Um, so it, it leaves a lot of questions, but ultimately I think it just continues to bring up the fact that that's an area that needs assistance in order to get more customers tied to the spectrum line which from my perspective is if there's any way we could create that program that provides a like a, a small loan type of assistance um that's something we can bring to the table when we talk to spectrum about extending lines down some of these roads that don't have cable is their concern is how many customers are they going to get well if we can say we have this much money to help our customers connect to you, we might be able to help sell them on the fact that expansion in our town is worth it because even the roads you already have served, we are going to be able to help other people connect to your existing line. And maybe that shows a certain uh, business relationship or partnership with Spectrum that the town can provide. Well, I, I certainly think our first priority should be getting all the roads covered before we get into um, individual homes. Because certainly helping a cable out to individual homes, we don't have it down the road, doesn't, doesn't help anybody. Um, and if we're going to do a program, or attempt to do a program, um, we need to get that question before town council soon, because it's probably something that's going to have to be established at an annual town meeting, I would think type of program and um, we, we're going to need to get to the town council on it I would think to find out if we can set it up how we have to set it up and what type of vote it needs or commitment from the town before we can do it right and I know that sometimes we use uh, different council when we're dealing with specialized activities and I don't know if this would be something where um, of course, we have to ask Jim Baird, but he may suggest that going to a different law office that specializes in this style of short-term bylaw specific to some type of program may be useful. I don't know. All right. And that's also probably another question we can put forward to uh, Ann Govey and Representative Berthew if there's something we can do. Uh, if it can be established, if there's a way to state. You know, it already has established right to do that type of law. I don't know. But once again, until we can get cable out to all these roads, it doesn't help us. We're still at this, you know, stalemate of not knowing if we can run wire on these poles. Because if we can, we can certainly contract the company to run it and probably do it a heck of a lot cheaper than the money we were quoted from, you know, from the cable company. So what's the next step? Do we need to see if we can get a sit down with Spectrum to figure out what portion they would be willing to accept if we did it and what standards they require for us to do it ourselves? Um, certainly would be a good idea to get that info from them if they're willing to do that. I mean, if their concern is the expense, you know, maybe they are paying a poll fee that's outrageous. And if we have the right to use a portion of the poll, then we can avoid that and lease them our wires for a dollar a year or something silly. You know what I mean? If we ran the wire, we lease it to them for the dollar, and for the dollar, they have to maintain it. It pretty much just establishes a wire form on our right of way, if, if we have a right of way on it. I mean, it, I definitely think it's something that we do need to bring to a meeting. We need to have Spectrum at the table and start talking about the options that we have. How can we work with them? Um, my understanding again is we do have some other towns that have worked with Spectrum for different reasons, like Princeton did their own, but they also have their own municipal light company, but at least it could explain where they drew the line between what Spectrum did and what Princeton does. And we can start to find out how we might be able to uh, take a, a program and apply it to Barry 
that may have already occurred before? I also think that while we have Josh on, we can ask Josh, um, you know, when the contract renews, I, I've been thinking about this. There's no reason we can't play hardball and say, look, you have to pick up the rest of the town as part of this new contract renewal. Um, if we have in, in home, in, in town, 3,600 homes, and even 2,000 of those have, have cable, you're, you're probably talking an average of 100 a month is $200,000 a month. It's a significant amount of money for them. It's two and a half, three million dollars a year they get from our little town for service. So to say, hey, we want you to run wires on the rest of the town, it doesn't cost them 750000 It might cost them a couple hundred thousand, but it's 10% of the money they got to take off the town of the year. And then they're also going to add new customers. It'll probably offset that cost anyways. So they might not want to do it, but if it's part of the contract requirement that they supply cable to the, all the homes in town within a year, um, I think we could get that down under the contract negotiation with them. Um, I, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't understand what leverage we have. We, we have two or $3 million worth of business they want in our town with their cable. Right, so is your threat that, they're, that we're going to um, take internet and cable service away from the entire town of Barrie? We, we go out with someone else. We can't. It's their lines. We don't own them. Eminent domain. They're ours now. <laughs> okay, well, you know, if you, if the selectmen want to take over, uh, take over negotiation from the cable committee, I think we're, we're, a, we're a subcommittee to you guys. So when 2024 comes along, if you guys want to go and try that gambit, I think you should have a lot of fun with that. But I'm not going to be involved in that because that's called, I mean, I would call that bad faith negotiation. I, you, I mean, good luck. Um, we so couldn't even the get them to the agree town. to a slight change to the formula in what they charge to run the, the lines down the street. So, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine. The, the cable contracts for pretty much every town in Massachusetts look exactly the same, and that's for a reason. So, I mean, if you want to try that, that's cool, but I, I don't think the cable, com uh, the cable committee is not going to get behind you on that. I don't know why they wouldn't. If, you know, we're talking about bringing service into the whole town. Um, we've got most of it, and I think they want to keep the most of what they have. It's certainly it's 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 simple mathematics. It's a business decision. Do you want to keep taking the two or three million dollars, or you want to throw it away? Well, I mean, I don't know yeah, why. That's part of the decision. The rest of the decision would be how much are you willing to to spend on the lawsuit that results from you essentially taking millions and millions of dollars worth of their lines away from them. Uh, I mean, that's yikes. You, you probably, it would be cheaper for you to run your own cable. How do you assess millions of dollars worth of lines? I'd be interested to put a value in that. Well, I think he means if you played the eminent domain concept. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that, um, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to look into the government end of this, but I'm, I'm sure that's part of this monopoly issue. They can't just have the town over the barrel like this to do what they want. We should have bargaining power. Now, if we're not finding, finding the bargaining power, we got to look harder. Quick question. Um, Josh, would you have something that you think the town should look at to have something to bring to the table in regards to what Greg is asking? Or could we also pursue clauses in the contract that allow the town to self-perform extending wire along the poles with the support of Spectrum um, according to Spectrum standards? So that if we have a road we wanna do, they're not gonna tell us the price, they're just gonna tell us what needs to be located where we install it and then they go hook up all their customers and tie into their, whatever they call them, repeaters or their junction boxes per se. We could certainly talk about that when the <clears throat> negotiation comes back up. I, um, you know, as I said, what, what we tried to get them to agree to um, in the last negotiation was that if, if let's say that you have a, a road and there's 10 potential customers on there and it's gonna cost, let's keep the number simple, $10,000 to run the line down the road, that we would say, could you guys 
basically charge people just a thousand dollars each because there are 10 potential customers instead of having to get exactly the number of customers and then dividing the 10,000 by however many you could actually get to commit and they wouldn't even go there. So it, that was not a huge ask on our part and they absolutely would not consider it. And what was the loss for not considering it? What's that? How was that a negotiation? What was the loss they incurred for not considering it? I mean, the, uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. I mean, <clears throat> we are, our lawyer worked with their lawyer and got absolutely nowhere. I don't know what else to tell you. You know, the, the, the way cable negotiation works, it's not like charter and our cable committee are sitting across the table with a negotiation. That's not what happens. What happens is we hire an attorney who does this for a living. And that's all he does is these cable things. And he goes and negotiates with their lawyers and they, they fight it out and they come back and they say, this is the best deal we could come up with. And, and it wasn't much. I mean, the only place where there's flexibility in these contracts really is the fee that's associated with what are you gonna charge the subscribers to pay for you know, public access and, and the cameras, the equipment that you guys got to, to wire the Selectman meeting room and things like that. There's, they're, they're happy to negotiate that because it's not money out of their own pocket. Um, but that's really the only point of negotiation that was even available to us. I think there's wiggle room there. We just gotta find it. I, I... There's other cable companies, there's other ways to do it. We have to have some power. There's thousands of people that have service here and they make millions of dollars off this town. Any company, they have millions of dollars up, up in a town, they've got to make some concessions. If, if they don't, then we need to draw a line and figure something else out for the town. If they're not gonna service this town, they're, they're no good to us. Well, if, you know, if, as I said, if the Board of Selectmen wants to take over the negotiation and apply whatever strategy you want, I think that's great. You know, we, we have a cable advisory committee because our contract requires us to. And our only official role within the contract is that if a customer can't get any help from charter, we can raise it to the government affairs people and try and get some help. And we do, we do that from time to time and that's great. We don't have to negotiate the contract. If the selectmen want to take over contract negotiation, you're, you're welcome to it. And we're a subcommittee to you. So if you brought forward these concerns from people like Critica and um, Mark and other folks to the state level, or have they not brought that to you directly? It's just come to our board. It depends what they're asking for. So if someone is saying, hey, my cable service is unreliable and I can't, this, the support people are not helpful and it keeps going out, um, and, and I hear about that, someone gets that information to me, I usually about, I actually hear about it through Facebook, then yes. Um, <clears throat> I send off an email, the government affairs people get right back to me, they escalate it, the service people are out there in a the truck the next day, and the problem goes away. It's happened a bunch of times. If what they're saying is, it's too expensive for me to get connected to cable, I can't help them with that. So a $3,000 connection fee is an acceptable fee to the government? It's in our contract. Our contract says that whatever it costs to get the line to, for, from the road to the house is the subscriber's responsibility and Charter will tell them what it costs and Charter will be reasonable about it. I guess you could argue that they were out of com compliance if you think what they're charging is unreasonable. I don't have that any I fact think in that is... situation, but I mean, it's, you know, it's per foot cost. So, well, and once again, we, that doesn't cover it with roads. They don't have a cable to. No, it doesn't. It doesn't want, they, I want it brought to my house and it's not down the road. <laughs> why shouldn't they have to bring it down the road? They do. And, and the contract says exactly how that works. They basically come back and they say, we'll run it down the road and we're going to charge the people you, you see, you look at the road and you say, well, I can get four subscribers 
and they will take the cost of running it down that road, divide it by four. And if all four of those people are willing to pay that bill, they'll run it down the road. The, the problem is that bill is thousands of dollars and people are not willing to pay it. So there's two separate ways they get billed. They get a connection bill to go from the house to the road and then they have to pay to bring it down the road. See, yeah, if they're close enough to the road, then there's no connection fee. There's like a, <clears throat> it's in the contract that if you're, if you're within so many feet of the road, it's covered, right? Because that basically it's, it's what's practical just to hang a line from pole to house, right? If they can hang a line from pole to house, it's not a problem. But if they need something in between, then you're getting into higher costs and they start charging for it. Right. And then if it's not down that road, the homeowners have to pay for them bring the cable down that road. Yes, exactly. And that's, and that's the agreement we have. And why I says we try to get them to negotiate at least to be a little more reasonable and cover, you know, um, people who may in the future connect up but aren't willing to, to connect up right now and they, they wouldn't buy it. We got nowhere with that. And that's not something you can bring to the state that they're not being reasonable about bringing the service down these roads. Uh, no, I, I don't know if the state has any regulatory authority here at all. This is all federal. I think, Greg, we'd have to uh, get deeper in with Spectrum on their proposals to bring it down to each road that they provided us. So we could actually evaluate whether we considered that reasonable. Right. Um, again, Josh kind of presented a lot of times what they'll do is they just have an in-house per foot cost. They see they got to go 2,000 feet, and then they tell you it's going to cost $200,000 or whatever. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's reasonable. It means it's the number they throw out, and if people bite on it, they get it. And if not, then you got to break it down. You got to look at how much material, what is the actual labor rate, what is the effort involved, and then you negotiate whether it's reasonable. If they fail to negotiate and you don't believe it's reasonable, then I think we have the ability to go to the government affairs group and state that here's our case and here's the reason we believe it's not reasonable. And then potentially the state will step in and assist you with that. But it's not going to erase the cost. It just may bring you down to a reasonable level. Why don't we look into and get some prices from independent companies for running cable down our roads? and see what they'll charge us to outfit those roads with cable. And we can compare that to the $750,000 that charter one. And I, I think we'll find that some company would come do that in a week for probably about $50,000. Um, because they don't have the right to tie into Spectrum system? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about simply the, the labor rate to run the material labor to run the wires. If they're telling us it's 750000 to run it, we can demonstrate that that's a 10 times overcharge. That's an unreasonable fee to run the wires. Yes, I think you're right. That would help so when you're sitting down to negotiate fair and reasonable costs. Right. Then once it's established down the roads, then we can start talking about hook up fees to houses and we'll, where we can intervene and help get you know, cable out to houses from there. But we need to get it down these roads and we need to get a price from someone. What would it cost to run these cables? Assuming we have a place to put them. What would it cost to run these cables? And if someone else says they can do it for 100,000 or 200,000, then, then charters out a line saying 750,000. We can get it done for a third or, or a quarter. You see what I'm saying? Yep. That, that, that lets us reasonably say, okay, we've got 100 grand, another 150, we can have cable to all the roads in town. And that's a town meeting ask, and that's done. We have cable to all the roads. And then we can talk about hooking up houses with some sort of loan program that for people that need it, for everyone that wants to tie in the service and be there. Or we could talk about when they do negotiations again with charter, if you've got to charge someone 3000 to hook up, can you, can you assess that to them over a two year plan or something like that? You know, you have a two, a two year program to set up for so much a month for two years and you got to get so much a month for this installation for two years till it's paid for. I mean, there's no reason that couldn't be broken down as well. That way they're getting all their money from the customer over time. But I think we need to get some prices uh, from some independent companies to run cable. 
Also, I just wanted to double check. If I recall, we had what four, five roads that we had spectrum estimates. But I think our list of roads after getting more input from the town is bigger than that. Do we have a full list of roads and an estimate for each road from spectrum yet? I have a list, the most comprehensive list that I've been able to get. And now this has even changed since I've gotten here on, you know, the more people who hear about these conversations come forward and then, then this list grows a little bit more. So um, I don't have any updates on any of the new roads that we've gotten since I've come here on what it would cost for those roads to be connected. All right. How many do you have on the list? I want to say 10 or 11 roads. That's what I thought. I, I definitely thought I recall it was growing beyond our original request from Spectrum, what, three years ago now? Yeah, it's definitely grown since I've gotten here, so. So what we really need to do is get a meeting with Spectrum but I think we need to do some due diligence to make sure that we're trying to talk about the whole picture. I don't know if we need to do, I know if you, we've used it before like survey monkey, um, but I'm wondering if we want to make some attempt to reach out to the town as a whole to identify if they have cable on the street and if they're connected to cable and then maybe a reason why they're not connected. You know, we, we need to kind of get a, a more thorough analysis because that also helps if I'm correct, Joshua, it, it helps us in presenting the data of the potential customers for Spectrum. And it also helps to identify the actual true percentage of our town that does not have access and why. Yeah, that would be great information to have. We, we, were, we tried various techniques 10 years ago or six years ago when we were negotiating the contract and <clears throat> we could not get that information. Charter doesn't, doesn't have it. Um, we don't have it. Nobody has it. And um, so, and then when we got into the negotiations, it, it was starting to look like it really didn't matter. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, I think it would be great if you could get that information. Um, I think serve, you know, putting up a persistent survey up there, um, it, it'd be a lot of work for somebody to go through and then take those results and map that back to, to where that actually goes on the, on the map. Although you're really only looking at the ones that say no. So that's, that's a smaller job. The um, I just checked the contract 125 feet. If your house is within 125 feet of the road and, and there's a spectrum line there, they'll just connect you. There's no fee. If it's over 125 feet, that's where they start charging fees. And the contract just talks about cost. <laughs> cost of the physical plant is what they talk about. So as far as they're concerned, they know what it costs to run a line and that's not you know anything that we've ever negotiated about. Quick question for the group. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with the world of assessing but is this something we should ask the assessor's office to start seeing if their routine or cyclical inspections of homes and businesses and properties, they now start making notes of who's got cable on the street and who has cable to the property? Because it's apparent that it's a value to that property to be connected to um, internet in a reliable manner. Well, I would think that Charter must know pretty darn well exactly what roads they have wires down. I've had people tell me that they've looked to buy a house. They ask Charter. Charter says it's covered. They show up and they have no cable. I don't think Charter or Spectrum is all that concerned about who are the who they are or are not covering in our town because we are such a tiny sliver of their customer base across the state, let alone the country. Yeah, yeah. they're big. They really just, we are like 
the rock under a barefoot on asphalt pavement. It's like, ow, what's that? And then they just take another step and avoid it. So we've really got to present to them a reason to partner with us or use the tools we have to identify percentages of population covered, the tools we have in the contract for fair and reasonable cost and take that route, I think. Otherwise, we're just fighting a battle and by the time it's time to negotiate in 2024, this battle actually creates a sour taste and makes it harder to negotiate in 2024. So my recommendation is we reach out to Spectrum with the concept of trying to partner with this. And as you said, Greg, what can we do um, or how can we work at reducing this cost? Say we find a way to get some of that work done so that they don't have to incur the cost and then they can come in and finish some of the work that we're not able to. And maybe that helps reduce the cost so we can start getting this done. Um, also, I think we all know that we're, like it or not, five, maybe 10 years, we're gonna have another one of those mass migrations west in the state. And I know the planning board's working on a lot of things that are gonna allow for kind of better development of some of our R80 areas that could lead to this being a better place for people to move without ruining the natural habitat per se of the town, but also allow for a little bit like clusters of a little bit denser population. So it, it's starting, to, it all rolls into just planning for the future. And if we're gonna do another 10 year contract with them, it's gonna hit at that time. And that's the time we need to be prepared. So hopefully in a few years, we have more information on that. So when negotiating, it kind of plays together. All right, well, I want to move on now. We spent enough time on this topic. Um, we're still getting nowhere with it yet. Still more questions and answers. Um, we have common particular license for a um, renewal for Becky's Bistro. Yes, she uh, was closed for a little while. Um, she decided to go back to nursing, but she's decided to open back up her um, you know, now that the weather is going to start getting nicer, have a modified schedule so she can still do nursing. Um, but we didn't renew it when we renewed everybody else's because she didn't submit a renewal request. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to make a motion for that? I make a motion that we approve the common victory license renewal application for Becky's Bistro. Second that motion. Motion to second to renew the uh, license for Becky's Bistro. Any further discussion? Okay, now I'll call for vote. All those in favor? Matt Urban, yes. Dylan Clark, yes. Okay, Gregor Sullivan, yes. Next up, Kent Colebrook. Change of manager and seasonal license renewal. Looks like a change of manager to Robert Moser. Is that right? From. Robert Beeland will be the new manager. And I think Robert Moser is the member of the board of directors signing off and saying, okay. Gotcha. There's a lot of documents to chase on that to make sure I thought I knew what I was talking about. Actually, the next one had more documents, but this one had enough. Right, well, yeah, the documents aren't as, uh, thorough looking as the other one. Um, but we take it at face value, Colebrook RV Resort LLC wants to appoint Robert Belland as the uh, manager for the campgrounds. So I look for a motion on that. Uh, I'll make a motion to accept or, or approve the 
two separate applications of change of manager and seasonal license renewal for Camp Colebrook. Second that motion. All right, so we have a motion and a second to approve the change of manager and the seasonal license for Colebrook Campground. Um, any further discussion before we move on? Of course, I will ask are they up to date on their um, fees, the town, the water, sewer in particular? They are in the process of paying back their back taxes. So they're not? They're not up 100%, but they are making payments. I mean, it was a significant amount. But it's my understanding that the history of Camp Coldbrook is that every year around this time of year when they come mm -hmm. to needing their license. It is, but they're not current right now. No. Okay, I make a motion. We have, I, I would think uh, we might want to table this until they pay up. This is exactly because of that. They, they don't pay every year and then they wait till they need the renewal and they ask for that and pay. Um, so I don't know. Um, in light of that, if you guys want to withdraw the motion at this point, or if you want to go ahead and vote. I would amend the motion that until they either paid up or have a written signed agreement of a payment plan with the treasurer's office, we hold off approving this until we have a confirmation of either. They're, they're caught up or they have a written agreement on how they're going to pay back with the treasurer. Well, we don't need to vote on that. We can just table it to that end, because um, I agree. Until it's either caught up or an agreement signed, I don't want to make, make a motion on this or move on this. So if you guys are all right, we'll table it until that's done. Tabling it sounds good to me. OK. Yeah. So when they've caught up or have an agreement to catch up, signed agreement, then we'll bring it back in front of the board. It's not going to be as early as two weeks. But, um, this is we go back three years of this. I, I, I've kept a lot of stuff out. The exception of our local personnel doing use of town property. I like everything done before it uh, comes here. Okay, common particular change of manager for petrol gas. And that should be change of business name, not change of manager. I'm looking change at of it now. business name. Yeah. Petro so gas, or what are they? What do they call it now? EPA. They're going from petro gas to apple green, I believe. Going to it. Yeah, Apple Green Convenience Stores, I think, is the official new corporation name. Yeah. And this is, yeah, there's a lot, lot more paperwork and documentation with this one. Registers with the state in Delaware. They have um, certified copies that are um, done with a, oh my gosh. Notary. Notary. Thank you. Got it. What, what a blank in that one. So, look for motion on the approval for. The license change to Apple Green New England Incorporated from Petro Gas. Make a motion. We... Oh, oh, did he make a motion? Did you make a motion, Greg, or ask for no, one? No, looking for motion. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, I'll make a motion. We approve the uh, change of change of name uh, application for from for Petro Gas to. Applewood. Apple, Apple Green, New England. Apple Green. Apple Green, New England Incorporated. Thank you. And I'll second that motion. We have motion to second to approve the name change from Petrogas to Apple Green. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for vote. All those in favor? Matt Urban, yes. Dylan Clark, yes. Virgo Sullivan, yes. Request to use town property, Barry Farmer's Market. <clears throat> and we hold this up for something last time to get what was it? That was the Lions Club for the car show okay, and the their insurance okay. policy. So it looks like we've that. gotten that straight, we got that straightened out today. So That'll be for the next meeting. But the the one question that you had regarding Barry's Farmer's Market was that $900 um, grant. So we did have that check pulled and <clears throat> we are gonna be paying the vendor directly. For the, for the porta potties. For the porta potties. Right. And Good. they will be open 
outside of just the farmer's market hours. Okay, so this says for the South Common, that's a normal location, May 1st to October 31st, every Saturday from 8 through 1. Um, they didn't check off of food to be served, yes or no, but I think traditionally some of the people do sell food items. Um, but I don't think it's organized by the farmer's market itself. Um, estimated 35 people. Anybody have a motion for that? I make a motion that we accept the Berry Farmers Markets request to use town property. Second. Motion to second to allow the farmers market to use the town property from May 1st, October 31st. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for vote. All those in favor? Matt Urban, yes. Dylan Clark, yes. Greg O'Sullivan, yes. Next, we have a wage authorization for a uh, Ms. Sizer, does this mean someone is done with their um, training and has got their certifications for procurements? Yes, yeah, I've attached all of the certifications with the wage authorization. Well, congratulations to getting thank certified, you. and thank you. It was a lot of hours, but I learned a lot. <laughs> well, good. So we're looking for um, approval to change the wage from Say seventy-four thousand to seventy-seven one thirty. What's the odd one thirty? I thought we had a three thousand cycle in there. Uh, final bump for that. No, that was just what Andrew was left off at the seventy-seven one thirty. Okay, that was the intent. Okay, I'm okay with that. So, looking for a motion to approve the uh, salary from today forward to be risen to seventy-seven thousand one hundred thirty. Okay. I'll make a motion. We approve the wage authorization for Jessica Sizer uh, from 74,000 to 77,130. I second that motion. Motion to second to approve the wage authorization for Jessica. Any further discussion? I would just make a note for the general public to know that this current salary only carries until I believe it's June 30th. And then we have a wage reopener with her to discuss in her three-year contract. So it'll right. be revisited come, I don't know, when you guys decide to do it in May or June or whenever. And, and also I just add to that, that this um, was part of our agreement and negotiations. Um, it, rather than start her with a former administrator left off, we withheld $3,000 until she was certified for our procurement officer, which she now is, and that's what brings her for a salary up to this point as agreed to in contract. So we don't have a lot of uh, wiggle room here anyways. Um, any further discussion, Dylan, anything before we move on with the vote? Nope. Go call for a vote. All those in favor? Matt Urban, Mark, yes. Yes. And Greg O'Sullivan, yes. Congratulations, Jess. Congratulations, Thanks. Jess. Hard work. COVID-19 update. So I'm um, trying to think of where we left off last time because I feel like it's just been a lifetime <laughs> since we had our last meeting as far as the world of COVID vaccine distribution goes. Uh, so I believe the last time- We left off just before this um, Legion inoculation. Yes. So that went well. Yes, yeah. Well, so on February 17th, there was our first um, vaccine clinic for those 75 and older. It was an excellent, clinic, um, I think not only does it speak to the professionalism of our staff and, and the, all of the hard work that they put in, but it was also, I was able to be down there for a couple of hours to help with checkout. And it was really great to see these residents um, who are a part of such a vulnerable population, you know, who haven't been out in the community for the better part of a year to get out and see people see the first responders and town staff that they've known for so long, you know, they were just so thankful and so excited to see everybody and see some of their friends. Um, so I really want to say thank you to everybody who was part of that effort um, to pull together the vaccine clinic. Unfortunately, on the same day that we had our first vaccine clinic, we were told by the state that we were not gonna be able to have any more first dose vaccine clinics um, and while we will be able to vaccine the people who got their first vaccine in Barrie for their second vaccine, um, until more 
supply is available, we're not going to be able to do any more first dose clinics, which is very, um, you know, I think it, it's disappointing for a lot of the residents who are looking forward to that experience. We did find out shortly after um, that first notification that we would be able to be a part of the Rutland Regional uh, Distribution Center. So thankfully, you know, Rutland has a good team out there and a Barry resident actually is, is running their clinics. So it's good to have that, you know, Barry connection. And, you know, he's working with 13 communities now to get the eligible populations vaccinated. And so there's just been a lot of confusion and a lot of movement over the past couple of weeks on what this new landscape is going to look for, look like for Barry residents. And um, as the clinics become available for Barry residents, the you know Rutland Board of Health lets the Barry Board of Health know, and then the Barry Board of Health distributes a registration link to people who contact her or the senior center um, to get that link. And the reason why we are moving away from actually publishing registration links out in the open is because a lot of times people who are not eligible for the vaccine will go in and take up appointments. And once that happens, um, you know, somebody has to go in and they have to go through to make sure that everybody who is signed up is actually eligible for the vaccine, which takes up a lot of man hours. So we encourage anybody who is eligible for the vaccine to get in touch with the Board of Health. And once the Board of Health, which she is the one who gets the, vac the registration link, the first one to get it, once she gets that, she immediately disperses it to everybody who's on her list. Um, and that seems to have been a pretty good system that we've had going so far. And that's how we did the um, the clinic that we did right here in Barry. That's how we did that as well. So I would like to, I think if this is a good time for questions. Um, I know that there has been so much movement in the past couple of weeks that I can't cover it all right, right now. Um, so I would really like to entertain any specific questions. All I know is um, last Tuesday, members of the state administration had a meeting to discuss this new vaccination plan where they kind of focused on max vaccination sites and large vaccination sites. And I felt that they did very little in trying to answer any of the questions as to why they took away local vaccination sites. Um, I'm only saying this right now from my perspective, I'm not sure it's gonna change a thing in the world, but it's disappointing when I hear that the governor's talking about a church in Mattapan distributing vaccinations and doing vaccination sites. When just last week they said that they were going to max vaccination sites because of lack of vaccinations coming from the federal government. Which has nothing to do with the number of vaccination sites you're distributing to that comes down to a logistics issue here at the state not supply from the federal government. The reliability of your vaccinations being delivered from the federal government is going to be adjusted every week based on what you actually receive. And if you don't have that incorporated into the plan and you don't have the ability to say, you know, Worcester wants 3000 vaccinations, Barry wants 100. We only got 20% of what we asked from the government. So we're only going to give Worcester 20% of what they wanted and Barry 20% of what they wanted. It's not a difficult way to manage this. But from my thought, it started with the paralysis by analysis. They're overanalyzing how to distribute it to the point that they've actually hurt the population from getting vaccinated because they're worried about the wrong people getting vaccinated ahead of other people. 
And now they are focusing on hitting certain neighborhoods because people are complaining that certain neighborhoods are getting more COVID than others. Yet from my perspective, vaccination has all been about trying to hit the most vulnerable population. And that should not matter what neighborhood you come from. But they've determined that it apparently neighborhoods inside 95 or around Worcester are more important than anything in Western Mass or Central Mass or those that are all of one town further away from Worcester than Leicester. And they do not provide a good answer for it. They have no answer and I'm beyond disappointed. I don't even know what to say because all I wanna say are just really angry, nasty things and I know that won't help. So it's frustrating. I know Jessica wrote a very good email to this Ann Gobi. I know Ann Gobi does not seem to be pleased with it, but I also think Ann Gobi represents a district that the governor doesn't really care about. We're not a big enough population. Her whole district doesn't even match, you know, say a Worcester's to the level of impact that the governor cares about. And so, not that the governor is ever going to hear this, but I'm beyond disappointed and it looks like he's actually, he's reaching a certain point where it looks like it's collusion. All right. I think we all agree that the um, state's new program is, is, you know, BS. And we also have to understand that right now we have no control other than call our reps and complain and everyone can certainly do that. Um, we should have the ability to uh, do the second vaccination. The people who received the first, so at least that's not uh, going to waste. You know, that will be achieved. As far as everyone else who wants vaccines, it's, it's ridiculous. And I agree, but there's very little we can do about it but inform people. Um, you know, complain, be vocal, complain loudly to your state rep, to the governor's office, and to your state senator, and make sure that they hear, make sure that the governor hears flood them with emails, flood them with phone calls, and make the complaints. If we don't, then they're not going to hear it. it. Doesn't bother them, then they're not going to do anything about it. So those of you that are interested in it, I would strongly suggest ringing the governor's phone off the hook until he understands that people are upset about this. The, the volume of phone calls and emails they get will give them some idea. Without that volume, they're never going to know how pissed off and upset people are. Um, that being said, let's, let's move on. Uh, we do know that, um, by the way, that Johnson & Johnson, the vaccine was approved today. So that should be getting released to the state and what they'll do with it, who knows? Maybe they'll have more vaccines and they'll rethink coming out to us. But once again. Mr. Chair, could I, could I ask a quick question about to uh, Jessica? Absolutely. Okay. You said you wanted to move on. So I just wanted to make sure it was okay with you. Uh, Jessica, when someone goes to townofberry.com and hits the COVID link, um, it sends them to a ClearGov page uh, that doesn't really have very much useful information for people. Do you think that we could get something together uh, just so pe so residents can more easily navigate the maze of getting a vaccine? I feel like uh, it's a little misleading to have COVID on that menu and not really have it give what most people are looking for. Yeah, I, I agree. I know that we have been trying to focus more on the latest news section of the webpage, just because that's the first thing that pops up when you come to townofberry.com. But I was, I was thinking about that today, that our, our ClearGov page is kind of um, almost automatically populated every week with, or every day with um, updates. And so as far as what, what we're posting with vaccine updates or clinic updates, that's something that we manually put in and we post that to, like I said, under the latest news page, just because that's something that is the first thing that pops up and then share it to Facebook as well. But I definitely think, uh, you know, we've heard, I've heard from a, a lot of residents today specifically um, about wanting some more information. And I think that we kind of find ourselves in a little bubble, a little municipal bubble where the employees always, we always know what's going on. And, um, you know, since the beginning of January, we've been saying, you know, call Board of Health, call Board of Health. And then I think that message kind of dropped off about two weeks ago after we found out that the Board of Health wasn't gonna be hosting any more clinics. So I definitely see where 
that public messaging could be picked back up um, because it might not be so obvious to, to everybody who hasn't been following along since the beginning about who to contact with questions. Yeah, I mean, I would love to just see an updated sheet, like a one pager or something. Maybe we could even print some copies up, print some copies out and post them at the Henry Woods and the library and the senior center, because everything seems to be changing every other week. And uh, I, I think the residents of our town are just as confused and irritated as, as everybody else. So I think we need to do a little bit more of a more of a proactive job of getting ahead of that and uh, having that information for people in as easy as a way format as possible. So if we could try to do something like that, I think that would really be beneficial. I would suggest it suggests it states the link to the state address because that's the only way to do the mine now technically. So I wouldn't I wouldn't get too complicated or no that's the problem Greg. It's well there's nothing we can do locally but said that they have no, everything is done locally because they're setting up Rutland as a regional they don't want people coming from the Cape. So what they've been doing is working with the towns to send the link for that particular vaccination site out to the people they know rather than posting it socially. So the rest of the state knows, hey, there's an opening in Barrie or Rutland. And so it's not as, it's not as consistently accurate to say, go to the state is all I mean. Oh, is, is because it, people get spun in circles and they go nowhere when they go to the state because they can't find the link they're looking for. Is Rutland supposed to receive doses on behalf of 13 communities again, or is that not happening? I thought that was not yeah. happening. Yes, no, Rutland is still receiving first doses because well, what they had to do was they had to prove to the state that they have the capacity to vaccinate 750 people a day. That's not what they're doing right now because they don't have that many vaccines every day but they still needed to prove that they could, um, if warranted, they could do that. And they did prove that to the state. Um, but as Matt was saying, when you direct people to the state links, the, those are only like mass vaccination sites. Well, where I, I understand. I was not understanding that Rutland was actually receiving them. If Rutland's going to receive doses again, why could not they send a portion for us to let us distribute them ourselves in there? Because the state won't let them. Yeah, the state won't let. If, if Rutland approves a vaccine place as part of their region here in Barrie, how is that going to conflict with the state rules? If, if they, as a regional area, are going to dispense some here in Barrie, how, how, how does that violate the state rules? I don't understand. Because it's the physical site that's approved for the capacity that the state Required. So they can't go door to door or anything around them. They have to just do them right there in the building. I find it hard to believe that there's not a way to. I don't, I don't That's know. That's how the state's treating it. They're treating it as if they're given a business license for alcohol. And if you try to serve that alcohol at another location, you're breaking the state's law. And so that's why the rug got pulled out from under Barry. Because technically, that's exactly how the Barry Clinic was already acting. The state delivered vaccines to Rutland and we asked Rutland when we needed them for the day that we needed our vaccines and we got them delivered the day we needed them. We used them up. And I understood that's why Rutland got so many was because they were serving communities like us doing that. Right. Um, so the same thing's happening, but now Rutland's been told to tell all the other communities, everybody's got to drive to Rutland to get the shot. No, at least it's not going to Foxborough in that case. That's much better than going to Foxborough still. So. One thing that did come up is uh, during that meeting last Tuesday is the state apparently is considering the drive to people's homes service concept that I discussed at the last meeting for those that cannot leave their homes or have difficulty with mobility. Um, they'll probably figure that out by the time it doesn't matter because the state's really good at acting on these things. They're, they're, they're quick. Please understand there's a lot of sarcasm involved in that because they well, they're pretty quick to pull the rug out from everybody, so they can be quick when they want to. Um, all right, let's 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 move on though. Um, it's just frustrating. We're gonna frustrate more people, but yes. I got one quick question, Greg. Mm -hmm. sure. Um the 
the woman that reached out to talk about cable service has been able to make it to the meeting. Do you mind just giving her a moment to just kind of speak her mind? I had mentioned that she, she was late due to a medical issue. Um, she just wanted to see if she had an opportunity to just speak her mind on her thought. And then I had mentioned there'll probably be no discussion back and forth. No, sure. We'll listen to cricket. So that would, there you go. Cricket, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was just reaching out because I have, you know, I've lived here in this town on this dead end street for 26 years and my neighbors have cable. So, um, it's a, it's a, the, the problem is Wi-Fi. The problem is not getting any type of good Wi-Fi here because we are in a remote location, but, um, we reached out to Kate, to the cable company. We got all the permits to the cable company. They were going to do it for nothing. And our roadblock is national grid. Um, I don't know what you're finding in the town. If other people run into this same situation, but national grid is charging the cable company to put the lines on the poles, stating that they need to quote unquote upgrade the pole, which <laughs> No national grid truck is going to come here and upgrade my poles. I can guarantee you that. Um, I just, I didn't know if anyone else came into the same problem as national grid putting a roadblock. Well, that's what I'm going to ask you about, Cricket. So they're not putting in a pole. They're, they're trying to say they need to put in a new pole. That's a $3,000 charge because they want to put in a new pole, supposedly. Well, supposedly, yeah. The, well, that they needed to upgrade, you know, because of the weight of the cable and, you know, please. Um, the the poles we have here are fine. Um, I think I've seen a national grid truck down here once, you know, pruning around the poles, only at my request. Um, it, it, it's just, it's a huge roadblock because they're charging $3,000. The poles are existing. There's no new poles added. It's just to run the cable. Now, if Verizon was to run, you know, another cable, I didn't, we didn't get charged, but we're getting charged from, you know, $3,000. Because again, the cable company was willing to pay for the cable to run. And again, I'm going to state this, my neighbors have cable. It's not like they're running, you know, miles down the road. We're the next house. Which neighbors? Like across from you, across the... It's like a, it's like a loop in the end. Everybody, every, yeah. So I'm a dead end, Greg, and um, my aunt Ian and Uncle Dave live next to me. Yes, yep, yep. And um, <laughs> everybody on the street has cable but me. I, I do know, and I don't know why, I do know at one point they were putting in taller telephone poles. So I don't know if there's a certain height everything has to be. Because the phone is typically the lowest in the pole, but you start mm -hmm. off and you have your high voltage, it's I think 13,000 volts in town. Then that drops down the transformers to the household voltage. Mm -hmm. And we have cable and then we have phone. So I don't know if they needed taller poles and yep. they were adding that other line in, or I don't know. I don't know why that would be. I mean, no, so are the other so, poles taller, or, or, or is this pole shorter than the others? Nope, these are all regular size poles just like the street just like everybody else has um and, and in all honesty when i asked the cable company to give me the exact reason they just stated they would have to upgrade their pole um to withstand the cable line now <laughs> my poles are the newest ones on the street <laughs> because i'm the newest house on the street so m everyone else could have their poles you know <laughs> with the cable it just seems it just seems so absurd that That's they're charging us $3,000. And I just, I, how, how long ago, it, it, you know, I mean, I've gone around this thing. I just wanted to ask about how long ago was, do you all those that the polls being provided for your home? 26 years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've been here for 26 years and um, I've never had an issue. You know, I've, I've never, 
I shouldn't say I've never had an issue. <laughs> we just have more people trying to use Wi-Fi and all these Zoom meetings. And, you know, I'm standing in one spot just to be able to talk on the phone right now. <laughs> and, um, and I will be honest with you, I, I, I work for a state police and I don't always get the text messages or the phone calls because I don't get the good service. And so we were looking to upgrade and unfortunately cable is the fastest way because we don't have Fios yet. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm hitting a real roadblock with national grid and I just think it's absurd. Um, and I just didn't know what roadblocks the town is hitting. <laughs> I'm just at a loss, you know. Well, we probably we haven't even stepped into that yet, Greg, have we? We don't even know what National Grid's going to do to us when we're done talking to Spectrum. Right. We need to, we're trying to find out right now from National Grid. We're waiting on the answer as to does the town have a right of way on those faults? And if we do, we can simply utilize it and run our wires down it, and, and that would be that, um, as long as they don't expect us to pay a fee. But there are there's two owners of the town. Some are owned by Verizon. Some are owned by mm -hmm. National Grid. There will be a label on that pole that will say VER for Verizon or NGRID for GRID. So you, you'll have a label that says if it actually is National GRID's pole, it's yep. Verizon's pole. Because it may not belong to National GRID. Yep. Yeah, these are National GRIDs. They, they definitely are. Okay. Yeah. Um, these right. are National GRIDs because I talked to, oops, so sorry. I oh, talked to fine. Verizon and Verizon said, yeah, we don't care what you do. <laughs> Greg. Right. Um, but yeah, no, National Grid was, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to suggest this. The poll's 26 years old. Um, I do think that Jessica reached out to, I think it's, it's Scott Farrar, right? Is our National Grid customer service rep? Correct. 26-year-old poll likely falls under National Grid standard maintenance program, and it sounds like they should be replacing that poll free of charge anyway. They've had 26 years of maintenance fees they've received to address that. I think they're pawning off maintenance and trying to turn it into a new install cost and get more money from one of our residents when the replacement of that pole should just be part of their standard maintenance. So I do think it's something that we should ask Scott Farrar to look mm -hmm. into on behalf of one of our residents because it sounds like National Grid is using a maintenance upgrade and trying to make a specific resident culpable for that cost. Well, thank you for calling in uh, Cricket tonight. That's what we were looking for, the information difference and um, you know, the specifics of if it was existing or it was national grid or, or charter where it was coming from. So that's yeah. what we needed before we could look into it more. So I'm glad you finally called in. Yeah. And like, yeah, no, thank you for listening to me. And I will say that Spectrum was willing to pay the fees, you know, for them to hang the lines and everything. They were willing, you know, it would cost them about $3,000. And they were willing to pay for that up front. It's just the national grid that's we've hit a, you know, we've hit a wall. Right. As we found out tonight. The so, connection so thank you for listening to me. And um, you're welcome. And if you if you need to get back on the agenda call, you can just call Jessica directly in the office or contact me again or or Matt. You know, we can get you on the agenda. Okay. Um, we just need to we we post the agenda on Thursdays before the meeting. So we need to know before end of business on any given Thursday before a meeting. Um, if you need to get on and talk about something, you can call the office or of course message us anytime. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank All you. Right. Now, now we'll move on to the transfer station contract for Solway Solutions. This is up last week. Um, you guys look through it. Do you have any concerns? Jessica, page three. I know there's a couple update, a uh, couple of dates that yeah, are. The dates, yeah. yeah. I noticed that 20, after. Twenty one, twenty one. Yep. That's that's all I was gonna say. Some of the dates is yeah. Think in here. But, um, otherwise, I have no concerns with it. Their fees aren't going up astronomically, but you know. I was gonna go over some of the fee differences if, if you're if. Well, yeah. Let's see if they have any comments for us, and then we'll do that. You guys have any comments to make on it at all? Let like Jesse go over the differences. Yeah, I don't have any comments. When was the last time we reviewed the equipment?
property asset list confirmed its accuracy and identified the um, condition of the assets? That's, that's a good question because part of the original contract is they have to maintain that equipment. So, mm -hmm. you know, if these containers are rotted through, it's up to them to replace them and get them in, in working condition, not to charge us for them or leave us with rotted through uh, containers. So. Yeah, I was, I was gonna mention that that was something that I plan on, I had contacted Patrick who runs the transfer station about going over that list. Um, so I'm just waiting to hear back from him on that. But I went over the list with Andrea from the Board of Health and um, she says that other than there was one roll off dumpster, 30 yard um, roll off dumpster that was replaced. She said that the list looks pretty comprehensive, but. And the condition of the equipment is the most important. Right, right. So that's something that I will go down and go over with Patrick when he's available. Anything else, Matt, Dylan? That was my biggest concern, just the condition of the property. Um, also, I'd like to double check. I, I see they, you know, they talk about the yard tool shed, the swap shed. Um, there's, there's a lot of damage to some of those. And I don't really see anything in this contract that really calls out a detail of what goes beyond a maintenance cost versus a capital cost. In other words, at what point does the lack of maintenance turn into a replacement? And then who owns it? Because we've got holes in our dumpsters. We've got doors falling off swap shed. We've got, and I'm not sure if this contract is the appropriate method or if this is something that we just need to ask the board of health, how they're dealing with that situation so that we can understand how they plan to maintain that site, whether if it's not through this contract, then where is it coming from? Because they need to probably start submitting a capital plan for these upgrades or replacements. The sheds listed in the property list, either A or B? I'm sorry, say that again. Are the sheds listed on either A or B lists on the property list? A. I do see a swap shed on B. Well, exhibit B, I'm sorry, I missed, yes. Yeah, so exhibit if, B, swap shed. I don't know what the yard tool shed is. I'm not sure what they define the little shed that they sit in at the top up by the paper compactor. Is that the yard tool shed? I don't know. That's more of a um, trailer, isn't it? Not a shed. I thought that was a, I haven't been in so long. It's a little box of a room that's about five foot by eight feet, maybe. Oh, and then uh, just uh, down below, they actually have a trailer. Right. right. Um, but in, in any event, we do have the CFC shed. And we do have a universal waste shed. And we do have the SWAT shed. So they are all listed as their responsibility to maintain. So if they are getting rot holes or holes or decay, then they're not keeping up with their contracts to date. So you know, they're going to have to repair those. And, you know, I don't know, is it spelled out in the repercussions that they don't keep things up? Failure to promptly pick up waste, willful mishandling, senior violation, traffic violence, failure to enforce waste, failure to open and close. Is, is there anything in here that gives them a penalty for not maintaining these, these properties? I mean, do we just have to maintain it and building for it. And that's something to discuss in the board of health as well. Yeah. 
if Matt's saying I had luck to go sheds on properly painted and properly cared for, the doors on on secure and locking, and they failed to do their job and then overseeing this, this property. Yeah, I'll definitely have a conversation with the Board of Health or Andrea tomorrow. <clears throat> and we'll go down and we'll look at the inventory down there. And I don't have the contract right in front of me, so um, I can't recall off the top of my head what the penalties are if they're not taking care of the maintenance or the maintenance schedule of it. So it just says the responsibility to look at Page that. six, Article seven calls out care of property. Thank you. It's very generic, but it does kind of say that they own the maintenance so that everything that they received is in the same condition when they leave, assuming a contract ends. And it's their duty to identify the list of work necessary to do that maintenance at the end of each contract. Right, it doesn't say failure. There's nothing in here for failure to do so. So we need to... Uh... Yeah, I think that ends up all the way down when it comes down to well, and the care, the last, alter contract termination. The, the last part of Article 7 and the first paragraph says the operator will be responsible for any damage caused as a result of the operator's operations under the contract and shall promptly repair or pay for repair or replacement for such damage and by consent of the town. So I think under that clause, if they don't take care of it, we can take care of it and send them a bill that would be enforceable in court. Now through litigation if need be. So I think we can probably point them out and have them fix them. And I think if they don't, we have the right to fix it and uh, pursue them for the cost of doing so. But I would assume they just take the guy on duty and have him repair and, and paint it. That's my understanding. I mean, that's how they, I think, redid that first like walkway between the recycle, the glass and plastic recycle bins. Right, that was deck. Um, but there were three decks. Now there's one. Well, if that's the case, then they should put two more decks back. So, I mean, but that's something where if you go to the list of Exhibit B, nothing in there calls out for the decks and doesn't indicate the decks existed. Okay. So that's where the development of the asset list is, in my opinion, uh, missing some stuff. Because by not putting it in the list, Solid Waste Solutions doesn't own the maintenance of it. Yeah, but it should still be there. If it's not, they have disposed of some town property and they'll have to account for that as well. On the list or not, they didn't have the right to dispose of that without asking us. Unless the Board of Health approved it because they manage a facility. So you have to take that to the Board of Health and see. So you got a good list of things to ask and look into. It sounds like mainly, other than that, I don't think we have any issues in making sure that these things get repaired and making sure that list is complete. And then otherwise, I think contract's all right. You agree, Matt Dillon? Dillon's yeah, young. just update this exhibit B. Somebody go on site and actually identify what's theirs and what we own and. And, and make sure they're up, that they are repaired. We're gonna be repaired. All right, so let's move on from that. There's nothing else to do with that. We have fishing game inquiry for property. Is this a, a, another one? No, so this is the same one from last time. I wanted to clear up because after the meeting, I had a couple of people reach out to me from the community to clear up what was being asked because I think that the letter that we received was very confusing um, on what the intention was. Not very clear to put it the least way. The, yeah. map, the map was very misleading. And, uh, yep. So, um, so once I talked to a couple of people from e, um, the East Quabbin Land Trust and um, somebody else from the community who's been very involved in this kind of development of the conservation land. Um, so the piece of land that's being purchased by the Department of Fish and Game is currently owned by somebody who is a part of the East Quabbin Land Trust. Um, the East Quabbin Land Trust, they attempted to purchase that piece of land 
through grants for a number of years, but they were unsuccessful. So somebody from their group decided to make it a private purchase so they could keep it within, um, you know, kind of their control. But now that property owner um, doesn't want to personally own that land anymore. So they are choosing to sell it to the Department of Fish and Game. Of Fish and Game. Um, so it will no longer be her liability or um, private property. So um, the Department of Fish and Game is going to purchase the land regardless of um, basically the, so they're looking for the Board of Selectmen support to just expedite this process because by law, the Department of Fish and Game has to notify the town 120 days before they purchase that land in order for it to take place. Um, and if the select board submits a letter of support, that'll allow the purchase to go through prior to the 120 days. And if the town does not submit a letter of support, then they just have to wait the 120 days to fulfill the purchase. So either way, they are going to be purchasing the land and they are they they mentioned that, you know, the concerns about the concert um, the Department of Conservation or DCR and Department of Fish and Game apparently has a much different mission, much different intentions than DCR has. Um, so they understand the select board's hesitation with DCR, but DFG has um, just different intentions. So is there first you're buying first private property? Excuse me, hold on. Is there a first right of refusal for the town in this? The first right of refusal was was um, given to the town a number of years ago when this property was brought out for the way I understand it's it, already owned by somebody else. So they, right. we haven't had a first right of refusal on this purchase attempt. I think the town gave up the first right of refusal a couple a couple of years ago before this purchase happened to allow this purchase to happen. What's the, did we know the purchase price for the land? It seems to be the town may be losing out on taxes in this. It's my concern there, but is there, and I would question whether or not we do have first right to refusal. That's why they have to come to us first. Right. Well, I can go back and find the actual first right of refusal when it was done, probably back in 20, anywhere between 2015 and 2017. But it was provided to the town, and the town um, refused that first right of refusal. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't know if that gives up our right forever or if we have that right every time that land sells. Um, depending on the type of land, so that that would have that would have excused us in that purchase that was already done. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that excuses us, eliminates us from having the right again. So we need to make sure of that. Now, Matt, go ahead now, please. I just wanted to confirm. So what we're being told here is this letter had nothing to do with acquiring town land. Correct. It's private property. Okay, because I wanted to go back and look at the letter again. So I better understand, I read it differently. That's why I was wondering if there is a first right of refusal involved. I understand if there was before and we didn't act on it and then they sold the property, um, it, that may very well mean that we have the right again, if it's sold again, that we have the right to um, pursue it if we choose to instead. I mean, is this a dollar transaction and we just keep it for the town so we, like I said, keep control over it? Or is this a, a substantial sale where the homeowner is getting some money for it, the property was getting money for it? I don't know. I'd like to find out. You know, is there a tax value to this property right now that we're getting? So that'd be checked in the assessor's office. So your list would be assessor check for taxation of the property, sale price of the property, and do we have a right to refuse? Anything else you guys want to add to that? No. No. All right, then let's move on to the uh, memorandum 
an agreement between the town of Barry and the coalition local 340. Chief, welcome. We're up to you. Uh, you guys have seen it presented. I think we made the changes, so it's asking for approval. So basically it's section six, we just get the verbiage that says it'll be the actual hour work will be um, not charged for those six times a day. That's what we're looking for. Okay. It seems you guys read it, it looks like exactly what you're asking for, Matt, to make that an exact match that the Zoom meetings is his actual hours of the meeting is what he gets on. Yeah, for. I saw that and I believe it covers any of the uh, concern I had about minimum. Yeah. Dylan, any questions? No, nope, looks good. Look for motion. Make a motion to accept the uh, memorandum of agreement with the local 340. Massachusetts Coalition of Police Local 340. Second. Motion to second to approve the memorandum of agreement. Any further discussion? Hearing now a call for vote, all those in favor? Matt Urban, yes. Dylan Clark, yes. Greg O'Sullivan, yes. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, meeting minutes, February 16th. I have no comments. Dylan? Now I looked through this and I found nothing uh, out of order. Okay, the promotion. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, we approve the meeting minutes of February 16th, 2021. I second that. Motion a second to approve the meeting minutes, February 16th, 2021. Any further discussion? Here now a call for vote. All those in favor? Matt Urban, Bill yes. Clark, yes. Greg O'Sullivan, yes. Um, we don't have executive session. No, those didn't make it into this week's Okay. Correspondence letter from the Conservation Committee. Dylan, you want to read the letter? Sure. Okay, what we have here is a, a letter to the Board of Selectmen from the Conservation Commission, dated February 24th, 2021. Subject, full member slash alternate member. It reads, Unfortunately, Kurt Wells, full member, has not been able to attend meetings in person or via Zoom for over one year due to health issues. The commission needs full-time members who can participate. At the Conservation Commission meeting on February 23rd, 2021, they voted to change Kurt Wells from full member to alternate member and move Frank LaRange from alternate member to the full member position. As alternate member, Mr. Wells, Mr. Wells will still be able to participate when he is feeling better. The commission is requesting that you support their vote. Um, Conservation Commission is appointed or elected? Appointed by the Board of Selectmen. Okay, just make, making sure before we move it, make any motions here. Um, so in that case, um, I would assume that these um, rotations and position require us to reappoint them both. Um, you guys have any discussion or thoughts? You just want to move forward. I got thoughts. Go ahead. Um, I think we got to be careful. We've generally allowed people on Planning Board and Conservation Commission uh, without making it a big issue that it worked together. But I do think we've got to be careful with creating mutual members of each board or commission that quantify a quorum of each. 
They're both five member boards. They both have an associate or alternate member. Um, if I'm correct, we have at least three, maybe four of the planning board members that are on the conservation commission. I know Frank LaRange is a planning board member, but he was an alternate on the commission. I think Floyd's a member of both. I think Alicia is a member of both. It's possible that Susan LaRose may be a member of both. So I think we've got to be careful with just making this appointment. It may be to our benefit to at least advertise the opening and see if we can get other applications for us to consider. Um, I have nothing against anybody involved. I just think that we got to be careful that we don't take a position that a planning board might make and have it roll directly into the Conservation Commission or vice versa. They have different roles and it may be to the town's benefit, assuming anybody wants it, to get a little bit more diversity between the two boards. But it's just something to talk about. Otherwise, if, if yeah. you guys don't agree, I'm okay with that and we can move forward. I understand the concern. I just don't know realistically how much these boards would conflict with one another in where we have potential harm um, with members on both. It's not a conflict. It, it would be more of a concern of the general public feeling like the two boards are working against somebody that puts in an application. Because many times if you want to build something, you have to go before both the planning board and the conservation commission. And in that case, either one or the other could shut you down. It wouldn't need both of them. Um, you know, you, you have to get past both boards no matter what. And, um, but they can only make a decision based on the jurisdiction they have. Yeah, true. true. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't think we said it's what it's a five member board. So they have four anyways, without that one and three is a quorum. So there shouldn't be a rush on doing this. So I have no problem if, if we want to advertise it for say two weeks and get back to us at our next meeting to see if, if anybody else has interest in the uh, full-time position before replacing uh, Kurt Wells. Um, and then if, if nobody does, then certainly we can make these moves exactly as they want. Um, you know, Kurt's been involved in a lot of different things in town for a while. He's pretty knowledgeable on a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, he's obviously run his farm in town for quite a while. So I do like his input and I hate to see him removed from it. Um, you know, if he can't do it, he can't do it right now. We can't expect people to, you know, to always be there for us. Um, but I would certainly entertain applications for a full-time conservation commission appointment, which Frank LaRange is welcome to apply for that as well, and, and may still well be appointed before someone else. I, I'm not saying he wouldn't be, but, but yeah, just to see if there's any other interests out there and people that might be active, um, I think it's smart. Dylan? Yeah, I think advertising it makes sense good to uh, give people an opportunity to get involved and I think always good to have potentially to have fresh blood in the mix as well. So I think advertising it makes sense. I agree with that. All right. So why don't we do that? When we advertise this, please yes, go online. Um, I don't know if we really need to get into the paper, but locally and maybe maybe put a post in a couple of town buildings um, and see if anybody has any interest in that position. And I don't know what duration is left. The appointments must have a term to we, we appoint these every year? Yeah. Uh, Conservation Committee, uh, Commission, I'll have to look into that. A lot of them are annual, but yeah, I'm not. A lot of our appointments are annual appointments. So. Yeah, but some of the boards I do know are like three year, three year, five year appointments. So and the appointments are elected ones into that. But let's just look into that, see what it is for duration, yeah. make sure it's a year. And advertise it accordingly, and we'll get back to this in two weeks. But even even if it is a year that 
it runs on the fiscal year. So whoever is appointed will need to be reappointed come June 30th, 2021. Yes. Good enough. Anyone else? Anything else? Nope. Selectman reports. Dylan? Nope. Matt? Just a reminder to the general public that um, if you really want to yell at me, you only got about two more meetings. Um, assuming we don't have an impromptu meeting coming up. So uh, I call you all in to throw me under the bus as quick as you'd like. I got two weeks from now, and then I got the first meeting in April that is currently scheduled. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. I'm not done serving the town. It's just I'm done serving for the Board of Selectmen, at least for the time being. Very good. Dylan, you have nothing? No, not this week. Uh, nothing I really want to dredge up in a report. Um, Yeah, we've covered the things I really wanted to, to discuss. Um, so we'll turn it over to Jessica. Thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the ambulance that was in an accident last week on last Monday, I want to say. <clears throat> so we did, we did have an adjuster come out and it looks like ambulance one could be out for an unknown period of time. It could end, be anywhere from like a month when it goes out to repairs to three to four months, depending on the schedule for the repair um, dealership. I know that I, after I talked to Chief Rogowski today, he said that they were able to fix it up enough to be on the road for now, because as we know, in town we have two ambulances. One is in better condition the, than the other. And the one that is in the better condition is the one that got in the accident. An ambulance two is really unreliable and our new ambulance two will not be delivered until probably July. So um, understandably so, Chief Rogowski was really um, nervous about ambulance one being out of service, but it looks like they were able to get it fixed up enough for the time being to, to still serve the town until we can get it into a dealership for some formal repairs. Um, and Chief Rogowski also let me know that in the event that we are out two ambulances, we may be able to partner um, with Rutland to, to use their ambulance for some mutual aid. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the ambulance? Just quickly, I don't know if uh, with any of the new COVID money or review of how COVID money can be spent, have we had a chance to review at the state or higher levels to determine if any monies can go towards an ambulance, the new ambulance, or even go towards repairs of existing ambulances that may put us down in critical need at short periods of time? I know that the CARES Act money cannot be used to buy, purchase any vehicles, which is what we've been preached to for since the beginning. Although we do see some towns still purchasing vehicles, so I just don't know how that how that works. Um, but I, I think it would be smart for us to not make any vehicle purchases with our uh, COVID money. I do know that on. Um, I could look into what kind of upgrades can be made to ambulances or emergency uh, vehicles. I do know that we did get a power stretcher with CARES Act money, which was a capital improvement item at about forty to fifty thousand um, dollars. So we were able to use CARES Act money for that. Um, but as far as any other upgrades, I can I can look into what would qualify as a CARES Act purchase. And that stretcher is on the ambulance that crashed. Correct. Yep. The ambulance, but luckily nothing inside was damaged and that stretcher is going to be able to work in the new ambulance that comes up. So um, luckily they are interchangeable pieces that we invest in. All right. Yeah. I was just curious if when you look at an ambulance one, it's what, five years old. Is that about where we're at, Greg? Do you recall? It's 2016. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
you reach that point, we all know that it's almost like police cars. You're, you're, you're running on fumes at that point, but how much can be invested to buy another, say three years out of that? If like, if you could dump 50,000 into that to replace kind of some of your worn down parts, can you buy three more years out of an ambulance like that versus what your expected average is? And that's where I'm wondering if funds towards a repair like that to extend the life of something versus a complete new vehicle might slip into the description of CARES Act funding. Yeah, I, I don't know how realistic it is to extend the life of those vehicles. The things and the systems in there, you know, everything from this. I mean, if you look at, if you ever looked at the electronics, you open up the panels and, and look at the electronics that are in there and how many systems are actually running. And that's, I think, the concern. When those things start to go bad, we're short of replacing hundreds of electric circuits and, and you know, resettable breakers and all the different things that they run between fan motors and air pumps and oxygen gauges and alarms and everything else that's in there, it's virtually impossible to guess what's gonna go next. You know, We've all had a car, we keep so many years, this year the car it might be 10 years down the road and, things just start going. And when they start going, you know, after your brakes and your calipers and your rotors, and you know, something happens to your drive shaft, your suspension and your shocks, your alternator, your AC, your belts. When these things start happening to the ambulance, you're, you're forever out of service getting them repaired. It's not like you're gonna go through and just replace all and hope you've gotten it. Um, and I just think it gets to the point where it's, it's the type of vehicle you can't afford to have in the shop to keep fixing. Not that it's overly expensive, but it's tied down constantly. And we can check with Chief Regalski to make sure, but that's the issue with the ambulances. And there's so many circuits in there that do different things. You, you can't just guess which one's going next. And if you want to replace them all, then you're rebuilding the whole box and you're looking at probably you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars again. You know, the basic frame for the truck is probably just a $50,000 truck and chassis. Everything else is what makes it an ambulance. It's all the upgrades and the, the fitting. So I, I, I appreciate the idea of getting along three more years, but I don't think it's a realistic thing to do with the ambulance. Um, okay. You know, a, a dump truck down the DPW, absolutely. Yeah, put a new dump body on it, fix up the frame, replace the motor, whatever, sure. But I, I don't think it's, well, check with Chief Rogowski if you want to look into it more, but I would be shocked if that was doable and if it was it would take a lot of time to do a comprehensive rebuild in a way to try to get most of the systems to go down but it, the ambulance is one of those things that we don't realize if you have a certain a couple of lights out it's deadline you can't use it you know for the osha standards and the governing rules for the ambulance everything has to be up on every light every flash every warning signal every oxygen sensor gate everything literally has to be up to standard running. So that's why it goes out of service. One little thing goes off and it's going to come out of service, you fix it. And you, there's just no way to predict. It's like, which light bulb is going to go out in your car next? Who knows? You know? I know if, it, if my inspection is due tomorrow, I know exactly which light's going out. <laughs> yeah, one of the headlights. But, but once again, even a marker light inspection, you fail inspection. And at inspection, you find out and replace it. If that marker light goes up six months from now, no one's going to notice it until inspection. But the ambulance, they check it every day. They find these things and go out. They go out. They have to come out of service. Because if you do get an accident or have an issue and you have a light out, then, then we're liable because we don't have the ambulance in, in proper running and service condition. All right. Every, every silly light on there is for a reason to meet standard somewhere. Uh, so frustrating. Frustrating to have it out of service. Um, thankfully it wasn't our new one in service already. That would have been really bad. And, um, you know, it'd be nice if they can get it up and use it safely until the, the full repairs and that, that, that would be fantastic. We'll, we'll see. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to mention that is that the town received a grant for the open space and recreation plan, which is, um, a goal of mine to get i got the application in pretty early and as long as i get or as long as i apply for the co-application which is part of receiving the money for this grant 
I have to apply for, I have to at least make the effort to apply for a secondary grant of about $2,500 in value, we will be able to get the full $10,000 to update um, the open space and recreation plan, which will be a good, a good, um, a good project to work on with the conservation committee and commission, I mean, and everybody involved. <laughs> that will tie right into the master plan. Yeah, it would definitely a book be a great um, great thing to couple with a master plan. Yeah, we probably should take a portion of that master plan for you right there. Um, well, usually a master plan works in conjunction with an open space and recreation plan. So usually you'll have the comprehensive master plan and then that master plan will reference the open space and recreation plan. Yeah, that's Part of the overall system is a point. That's oh yeah, it's nice. we have, we'll have plans. We're gonna have plans. Uh, and then we're gonna follow through it. <laughs> yes, exactly. The, Sorry, the implementation ahead. is the key key part of it. But, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention was that to, today our tents were delivered and they are currently at the DPW. Um, I wasn't expecting our tents to be delivered today. It would have been nice if I got, um, a heads up because that's a pretty big delivery for them to come and spring on me. But uh, luckily, Jason was around and had the forklifts to take off those tents from the delivery truck. The total number of tents was? It's 10. 10 tents? 10 tents. More than I expected. I didn't think we get that high. I think, I'm pretty sure that's all. We're like at seven. So we have 10 tents, and how many are fully enclosed? We have three enclosures? We had. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head how many it was. So they bargained in price with you, obviously. Yeah, we got a great deal. Yeah, because we were talking seven, so. Yeah, I think it was ten tens. This is, I would have to look back at the numbers, but um, yeah, I was not expecting them to be delivered today, but. Um, so we need to find homes. We for need those. to find homes for them. And <laughs> I, like I said I would suggest. I, I'm sure if you talk to the fire chief, police chief, they want to put one or two in each. Possession for I know the chief of police has been doing a public safe a day every year yep. and doing hamburgers and hot dogs for the public and an open house. Um, they would not have to rent a tent for that. They could use one of those yep. or two of those. Um, so they might want to have. My idea when we talk about these smaller tents, if we put them in different departments, a couple of they have a couple of station one, station two. We have um, station three for storage, which we can put some in. Senior center may want one or two. Yep. Whether we put one in control of the library for outside functions, but I'd like to see them go around and find homes. Um, yeah. Senior, what's being used in the basement of the senior center or the ground floor of the basement of the senior center? That's just storage at the moment, anyway, isn't it? Probably. Currently, yeah. Currently, it's not being used. I mean, currently, it's under uh, repair, but. During COVID times, it hasn't been used for anything. Okay. And we do have um, station, what used to be station two in the um, South Ferry by the baseball field. That's really just a storage area now for the fire department. So there's certainly some room there that, I mean, I, don't, I haven't gone in the building in a couple of years, so I don't know what it is with space, but I'm sure that something can be stored there. Um, for the fire department, however many the chief is going to store to make use for whatever. And the fire department does functions too occasionally where they could use those, you know. And um, same thing, I'm sure DPW with, you know. I would also suggest you might as well, I would recommend that when the time comes, I won't really be involved or have a vote. Um, start drafting up the annual town meeting layout prepare to have tents ready for that anyway, so we can have an, I would suggest an outdoor meeting again. Um, hopefully by then we've reached a, a better level of, or should I say less restrictions for social distancing, but those type of meetings are the reason we bought 10 or seven or whatever the number ended up. Um, I would, Start that now to see what you can coordinate, plan, and commit to. Because I also know that if you wait to the last minute, the use of the school is a lot less likely because they usually have graduation ceremonies. So if we can 
you guys start talking to them now, you might be able to set up a certain date that might be a week earlier than we normally do it, but it avoids their graduation ceremony weekend. Um, so if you, if you want to do that, or even again, we're talking tents, Felton Field, you know, I'm just throwing out some options now because we do have them. No reason to wait on planning on how we would use them. You can get that set up now. So by the time it comes, everybody kind of knows what they're doing. It could, it could still have the meeting back to Bartles Lane. If it's in the springtime, it's not muddy. Um, you could have it in the field up there as well. Um, the only concern in the parking lot is anchoring the parking lot, which it can be done whether or not they want it to be done. Um, and you can also weight them down instead of anchoring. They could, you know, but that becomes more of a project to bring in heavy weights uh, to hold it down. Uh, all things to look into and discuss, even up at the high school, whether we could use a field up there as well. For example, they'll park on the um, field hockey fields. You could obviously anchor there by driving the bottom of the ground and we'll hunt the field in places to get the meetings out, outdoors still. Um, and I'd be curious to do it outdoors, maybe outdoors, I, I don't know if Saturday was smarter or not, like we did our special town meeting. Um, people are used to the annual town meeting being on a, at least Tuesday night normally, I believe. Um, you know, maybe people would like it to be in a Saturday. Maybe we uh, start putting that out there. You get input from, from the town, whether they would rather to see a, a Saturday annual town meeting um, under tents, or if they prefer us to uh, to, to Tuesday. But it's every like, but very likely we'll do it outdoors anyways in this June, just because of everything going on. I think there'll be a lot of people more comfortable. I certainly think it's cooler if we're under a tent instead of in, indoors. Sometimes it's pretty stuffy in that gymnasium, uh, the cafeteria up in uh, Muggles. I agree. Let's look into homes for the tents and start looking into planning where we want to do the meeting. Um, contact with the superintendent because we usually use what we're saying indoors. Maybe we can do outdoors at either venue um, where we can set tents up that they wouldn't mind us anchoring the tents. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we'd be using 10 tents, but the, you know, we can figure out depending on the uh, separations required by COVID and the actual capacity to do the tents. What we can Glad to see the red. And that's uh, about all I have for tonight. That's it? I think so. Wow, here we are at uh, 8.37 and we've run out of business. And 10. Looking for a motion. motion we adjourn. I'll second the motion to adjourn. Motion is second to adjourn. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Matt Urban, yes. Dylan Clark, yes. Ariel Sullivan, yes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good one, Sandy. Jess. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Uh